Before I continue on with this review, I'm doing something pretty cool this month thanks to my sponsor, Voidu.com. I'm going to be giving away a free code for Borderlands 2. I chose this game myself because you can always deal with more codes for a co-op game. Maybe you own it, but your friend doesn't and you want to play with them, so enter this giveaway and throw the code at them. If you want to enter this giveaway, it's pretty simple. You have to be subscribed, click the bell notification next to the subscribe button, like the video, favorite the video, and leave a comment down below saying that you want to enter this giveaway. Like I said, this is thanks to my sponsor, Voidu.com. Voidu is also currently having a schools out sale, so if you click the link down below in the video information linking to their website and use the coupon code schools out, everything will be 20% off. Be sure to go to their website through the link down below in the video information. This also acts as a tracker for my progress, so it helps me if you do that. Back to the review. Area 51 is interesting because I get comments all the time saying I should play it and review it, and usually their comment says it was one of their favorite games from that era. But I actually never played it back then. As a kid, I was usually pretty busy doing baseball, basketball, cross country, boy scouts. I was just outside more as a kid than I was inside playing video games. I actually wasn't really big into video games until I got older. Or at least I was big into video games, I just didn't have the time to play them. Point being, I didn't play the game when it came out, and I only played it for the first time just a few days ago. I would like to say this game doesn't hold up through the test of time, but I don't think that's really the case. This game came out in 2005, and to give you an idea of the era that this game came out in, that is when bands like, say, Hoobastank and Breaking Benjamin were mainstream music. If you listen to the radio, that's probably what was on the radio. Man, I wish we could go back to those times instead of the pop shit we got now. Point being, it's kind of retro now, but even back then, shooters weren't exactly new. Doom came out 12 years before this game. Half-Life 1 came out 7 years before this game. Halo 1 came out 4 years before this game. And just the year before, the big three of Doom 3, Half-Life 2, and Halo 2 came out. Even the year this game came out, 2005, Fear was released. On top of all of this, Halo 2 had completely just dominated the market. This was before Call of Duty 4 came out. Halo was the main shooter and everyone had an Xbox. Everyone was playing Halo 2 on Xbox Live. So shooters had been well explored by this point. Not quite to the point we are today, but they definitely weren't new. Both on PC and console, things had sort of been figured out a little bit. Both in terms of gameplay and controls. A mouse and keyboard is natural for a shooter, and Halo 1 did a pretty decent job fine-tuning controls to a controller for a genre it really wasn't made for. It's still pretty terrible in comparison to a mouse and keyboard, but still, Halo 1 did the best you could possibly do, and before that, controls for shooters were pretty awful on console. Point being, this is not a case like Goldeneye where shooters simply hadn't been explored very well on console. They had been around a while. So this can't really be a test of time if great shooters, some of the best of all time, came out just a year before it. So why do people like this game so much? Well, I have two theories. The first one is that people just played it when they were young, and you tend to really like the games you play when you're a kid. You just remember them fondly, you got big nostalgia goggles. The second one is that this game actually did its best on PlayStation 2. Now, even though shooters were not new at this time, PlayStation 2 didn't really have a whole lot of shooters on it that weren't third party. In fact, the only first person shooter that comes to mind at that time was Killzone which was toted as quote-unquote the Halo killer and then sort of flopped it wasn't very good. Thankfully, Killzone 2 and 3 were pretty decent, but the first one just kind of was a little bit of a disappointment. I still remember it. Man, I got kind of excited about that game and then it just, just wasn't very good. Regardless, it wasn't like PC which had Half-Life and Doom and all these other amazing games, and it wasn't like Xbox that had Halo to compare it to, it just didn't really have much competition. Sure, there were some third-party shooters that were amazing, like say Time Splitters 2, but that's not really the same thing. I'm saying all this as if Area 51 is terrible, and it's not, but it's not really that great either. Let's start with the graphics. Graphics are actually pretty decent for a late PS2 era game. Now I played this game on PC, so the resolution is going to be higher than what you would have gotten on the original PS2, but other than that it should look basically the same, and for a late PS2 game it does look pretty good. Slightly above average, doesn't blow me away, but it does look pretty good for the limited hardware I was dealing with. It does everything standard you'd expect from a game of that time, except quality is a little bit higher. A little bit better textures, a little bit better lighting, in general it's just a good looking game for that era. But how's the PC port? A little bit hit and miss. For the most part, it's pretty good. It runs steady, no frame rate drops, and usually doesn't crash. But later on in the game, I started running into an issue where it would crash at the end of almost every level, which was really infuriating because then that means it didn't save. This game runs on checkpoints, so I had to go redo half the level every time it crashed. Thankfully it didn't crash the second time it got to that point, but still that's a frustrating experience. But the infrequent crashing is not the big problem. The big problem is the FOV. This also applies to the console versions, it's the same on both console and PC, and there's no way to change it. The FOV by default is 60. 
not vertical, horizontal. 60! That is the worst FOV I've seen in any game. That's worse than Far Cry 3 on console. This is not playable for me. Thankfully on PC, there is a way to fix it. There's no menu in the game to change it, so you have to rely on third-party options. There's a program you can download that will require you to open the exe file within the program and then change the FOV to whatever you want in that program. Thank god you can do this. The thing that's confusing though is that usually with games that lock their FOVs to such a, a strict narrow vision, it'll cause problems if you raise the FOV because the animations weren't made for it. But with Area 51 that's not the case. The animations worked perfectly fine at a higher FOV so I cannot understand why they did this. Unfortunately, this patch is a little buggy because after some cutscenes, it will default your FOV back to 60, but then it'll fix itself after the next cutscene, so unfortunately it's not 100% consistent, but at least it's better than just being stuck to wearing horse blinds the whole game. Even if you're one of those people that doesn't care about the FOV, this would still bother you. It is... God, I, I cannot describe how bad this FOV is. It is, for me, not playable. But with that rant out of the way, let's move on to the story, and I don't really know where to begin here. The story is kind of incohesive and doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but the game is also called Area 51, so that's expected. The gist of it is that you were sent into the literal Area 51 site to clean up something that went wrong. Originally this starts as a containment failure, people being turned into mutants, and you have to go clean it up. But then you get pulled into fighting the literal Illuminati, and eventually throughout the game you come across the Greys. There's a lot going on here, but it doesn't exactly make a whole lot of sense. Be prepared to be confused. The thing is this game could have done a really good job with the story if they didn't take it so serious. At one point you stumble across a literal fake moon landing site in Area 51 and this was obviously humor. It was great. It was funny. I actually laughed and enjoyed that part. If they took this route the whole game or at least throughout some parts of it, then it would have just been a lot better, but instead they tried to take this goofy over the top Area 51 story and make it serious and it just kind of didn't really work. But all this sort of doesn't really matter because all you really want to know is how's the gameplay. That's sort of the biggest most important part of a game, you know, the gameplay. Well, it's a little hit or miss. The guns across the board feel great. They were a lot of fun to use and I enjoyed all of them, especially the shotgun. I, I want to talk about the shotgun real quick. It's a double barreled Spaz 12. Just the design on this thing is so simple in concept yet amazing. Seriously, it's just really satisfying to use. You can fire one barrel at a time or two barrels at a time and it feels like you're firing a truck into them. It's so satisfying. To make it even better, if you walk across another shotgun, you can dual wield, meaning you can fire four barrels at once, and that's just ridiculous. Unfortunately, the dual wielding is a little bit weird in this game. It doesn't happen all the time. You can't just swap out to the other gun you also want to dual wield. It only happens when you walk over that gun, which will then interrupt whatever you're doing to pull up that other gun, and now you have two. You only dual wield until those magazines are empty, then you reload the main one, and you just have one again. It's weird, and I don't really know why they did this, but... At least it's there. Regardless, the gunplay feels pretty good. Unfortunately, the enemies don't give me the same sense of satisfaction. Some of them are pretty fun to fight, like the mutants, which generally I don't like enemies that just run straight at me and hit me because that's somewhat bland and doesn't really force you to change what you're doing, it's just all muscle memory, point click, and they eventually die. But in this case, with the guns you're given, the mutants are actually fun to shoot, and if the game had more of them, I would have been happier. But unfortunately, basically any enemy that has a gun it's just kind of annoying. Now they're not entirely bullet spongy, but they definitely have a little bit too much health. Although I think the biggest problem with this is just sort of the combat arenas you're thrown into. Most of the time, it's just enemies constantly pouring out at you. It doesn't make you do anything else, it might as well just be a Call of Duty game at that point with brain dead enemies all running at you just to have you shoot them over and over, and that's it. That's really the whole crux of it, and that's what made me feel so... so worn down by the time I beat this game. Go into a room, six enemies already shooting at you, the enemies do a pretty good amount of damage to you, more than you do to them really, and it's fairly difficult, but in a way that doesn't feel satisfying, just annoying. To make matters worse, they have you fight the Greys later on in the game, and they could have made a really interesting alien enemy here, there's a lot you can do with this. But what did they do? They gave this enemy a shield, and had him spawn a bunch of clones all around you that kept shooting you until you killed it. Why? Why do we need enemy spawners? That's just obnoxious. It just feels lazy and draws the game out farther than it needs to. And honestly, that was kind of how I felt about the entire game. It started pretty good, but then about halfway through, 
It just kind of felt like they were trying to stretch it as long as possible, with enemies constantly pouring in at you, and you're gonna die a lot by the way, not because it's terribly difficult, just because it's so tedious. It's not impossibly difficult, in fact you'll probably only die a few times and never really get stuck for too long, but it's definitely more on the difficult side than the indifferent side as far as difficulty is concerned. There's a right way to do difficulty, and it makes the player feel satisfied, but there's also a wrong way to make artificial difficulty that will make the player feel annoyed. Again, this game isn't tremendously difficult, it's just tedious and slightly annoying. To make matters even worse, this is a console-based shooter, so it runs on checkpoints, and the checkpoints are really bad. Did you watch a long, unskippable cutscene? Well, I guarantee you the checkpoint is before that cutscene, not after, so get used to watching it over and over again. Did the game introduce a new enemy to you that you've never fought before in a cutscene? Well, you can't skip this cutscene and the checkpoints before the cutscene. Have fun watching it. Even when the checkpoints aren't completely awful, they're still slightly annoying. Is there a difficult section of the game? Well, the checkpoint can't just put you right outside the door in front of said difficult section, it's going to put you three rooms away where there's only one enemy in between you and the difficult section. Why not just let me try again immediately? Why do I have to walk all the way over there? And when the checkpoints aren't doing some bullshit like this, they're just kind of being bad. Putting you all the way back and making you replay half the level again. This is definitely part of mid-2000 shooters that I don't miss, and really makes me glad that I've mostly been a PC gamer my entire life. Quick saving is an option from the gods. Although it does lead into some interesting weird things in between console versions and PC versions, like say in Far Cry 2 you could quick save on PC but you couldn't on console, which gave a real purpose to Outpost, you could only save there, but on PC they didn't really matter because you could always quick save. The Outpost did give you a place to talk to your buddy and change the time of day if you wanted to and get some more ammo if it was upgraded, but for the most part you could ignore them and play the game just fine. On console that's not an option unless you never wanted to save. Anyway, getting off topic. It's a bit disappointing because the start of the game is very promising and I was having a lot of fun with it but it just slowly goes more and more downhill as the game goes along. It really does feel like they were just trying to stretch the length of the game out. And even then, the game will only last you 5-6 hours. It's not tremendously long, but it is, well, about average length by shooters nowadays. And that's probably the best way I can describe this game. Mediocre at best. I would actually put it a little bit worse than mediocre because it just wasn't that great of a game. I feel like people remember this game really fondly just because it was part of their childhood and they played it on the PS2. And like I said, the PS2 didn't have a whole lot of other shooters to compare this to, so it looked really good in comparison, but if you had played other shooters of its time, you know, Halo 2, Half-Life 2, Doom 3, Half-Life 1, Doom, then you likely would have just shrugged the shooter off as another mediocre shooter. I might be being a little bit too hard on it, but if I had to put it anywhere on my scale, it would be about right here. I wasn't terribly thrilled to play it. So would I recommend you guys go back and play this game? Well, actually, kind of, but there's a catch. The game is actually legally free. The publisher just kind of went, hey, here you go, release it on PC, put it on the internet, you guys can download it and go have fun. The game is abandonware now. You can't buy it anywhere. Obviously, new prints aren't being made for consoles, so if you wanted to buy it for console, you'd have to find a used copy, but those are all under $10, so that's not a big deal. But on PC, you can download it for free and play it if you want to. Very little buy into that, there's not really much risk. If you don't like it, well, then you can just uninstall it. But personally, this is kind of something if you're really, really bored and don't have any other games to play. Otherwise, it's not really worth going back and playing. It might destroy your memories of this game if you really liked it as a kid. But that sums up my review. Huge thanks to my patrons popping up on screen here. If you guys want to become a patron, you can check out my Patreon, link down below in the video information. Thanks to you guys doing things over on Gokbox. Gokbox is kind of interesting if you don't know what it is. You can play mobile games and then actually donate real money just by playing mobile games. So if you want to check that out, that's also down below in the video information. Thanks out to everyone on Twitch giving me bits and donating over there as well. Just thanks to all you guys. You guys are awesome. And also the Twitch plug, if you guys want to join me on Twitch, there's a link down below as well. That's where I streamed Area 51 in its entirety, so if you want to come join, then you can come hang out. I love talking to you guys. But that sums up my review. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.